Okay, I'm Ronnie Bull. I'm a professor at uh, Utica College. Uh, these two are my students, um, Sean and Aaron. Uh, they did this stuffer as a project for a class of mine. Um, basically, I kind of challenged them to see if they could do this, and they accepted it. So uh, I'm going to let them take it from here and then present to you guys the stuffer. Thank you. So before we begin about the stuffer, it would be uh, give you a quick rundown on what a TCP header is for those who need it. So um, TCP header deals with the transport of the packets sent along the internet. So, you know, it has the source, destination, see where you're going, where you're coming from, size of the window. All we're concerned about are going to be two things, the reserved and padding. Uh, those don't carry any data, while the padding is, padding is small bytes, six, and the no, reserved six, padding is variable. But, yeah. Typically, they don't carry any data. They're, if you look at the documentation, they're reserved for future use. So that means we can play with it. So, t so the stuffer is a p packet stuffing. You can count how many times I say stuffer, stuffing. Uh, we'll take the padding and the reserved sections of said TCP headers and set them along the internet after we stuff them with our own information. So what is stuffer? This is it. Run in Python uh, with the help of Scappy to do all the heavy lifting for us. All we're doing is making a packet, putting our own data in it, sending it along where we want it to go. The code is on GitHub. You do not need to take a picture of the slides. So yeah, uh, this is our first prototype proof of concept. Uh, our demo's gotten a bit out of hand since our project. So uh, you'll see that in a minute, but um, yeah. So we're doing them an hour. Okay, so I get to talk to you about the practical applications of this thing that doesn't seem very practical at all. That's my favorite part. So one of the most common scenarios to use this is once you've hidden information in the padding and flagged the reserved bits so that you know to look for the information while it's there, you can actually set up a lot of covert data channels between two people who both know that the program is installed in their computers. We'll come back to those that don't later. So you can actually set up a hidden channel in which you can pass surprisingly large amounts of information on things like video streams over existing internet connections, specifically any sort of TCP socket. Now, this has the benefit of not being picked up by most firewalls because nobody does deep packet inspection to see whether or not you've played around with the reserved bits and whether or not the padding is actually zeros. So you can actually hijack existing data streams inside of a network which you've already exploited, get communications going through, extract files, send messages. There's no encryption built in, but I suppose you could encrypt your text before sending it through, either with a cipher or anything that actually counts as encryption. But we don't have to worry about anything such as data integrity because we use TCP instead of UDP, so it's all guaranteed to arrive there in the correct order. If it doesn't, it gets sent again, which is great for us because we're lazy. We don't want to worry about that. So we let them take care of it for us. Now, when it really starts to get interesting is when you start getting into things like botnets. Now, one of the easiest ways to realize there's a botnet on your network is when the botnet starts to reach out to command and control ser servers to find its instructions. Now, the thing is, if it's just reaching out to a normal website and downloading a giant text file that's a PowerShell script, you kind of start to catch on that something sketchy is going on. But if you instruct your botnet that if I send you this particular section in the padding, you can hijack existing streams going into that user's machine, because assuming you've compromised somewhere upstream as well and can insert the data. So your botnet can actually read information carried along existing traffic that the user themselves is doing. So anyone even looking at their computer can say, oh, yes, he opened up Facebook. But your botnet knows to look in that information, see that the reserve bits have been flagged, read the padding for its instructions, then carry them out. And there's no extra traffic at all, which is kind of cool looking because turns out companies that read the uh, instructions for how to implement things such as TCP really trust that you're not actually going to touch the reserved bits. I'm not sure why they trust us. Because, well, once you play with the reserved bits, you can do a lot of dangerous things, but you can. 
You can also poach entire websites through this. We can't get this demo working here today because we did not want to rely on the internet of a convention center that a bunch of hackers are currently in because we know better than that. But you can actually push basic HTML web pages over an existing connection. So if you have a web server of a rather popular blog and you want to hand out information covertly, you can have people navigate your blog with the program running and actually have an entire second web browser grabbing the second website on top of your existing website and no one else is any the wiser. My personal favorite though is when you compromise something such as an upstream router on a network without compromising the client machines because you can start actually grabbing information as it flows through and extracting it covertly and you can also do what I have decided to call session-based denial of service. I'm sure somebody has an actual name for it because most things have been done before. But you can actually, because you're messing around with the information, if you don't very carefully modify the packets, you accidentally invalidate the checksums. And you can invalidate the checksums by playing around with the reserved bits. And if you change the reserved bits, then don't fix the checksum. Every packet gets dropped. And nobody will really realize why, because nobody thinks to check the reserved bits. That's a recurring theme of this entire talk. Please check your reserved bits, because people will play with them and then break your things and have a lot of fun doing it. So now, I'm going to have my lovely assistant here take over the computer, and we're going to show you and point at things and say this is what actually happens and do some demos locally, because we don't trust the Wi-Fi. Would you like to take over the computer? Yes. All right. Oh, yes. Actually, let's finish up the last few slides. Cool. So, right now, the thing about Stuffer is it's more of a concept than an implementation. We do have demos, obviously, because people like to see things work. But it's more of the concept of playing around with the TCP headers and inserting information into them. Right now, it's running Python 2.7 because all of the actually good libraries run on Python 2.7. You can port it over to Python 3. Scappy does work. A few of the libraries which work with Scappy don't work, but that's an issue for someone else. And also, one of the things we really played around with but couldn't quite get working and no way to demo it anyways, is actually routers such as PFSense, if you have any of them running at your house, I'm sure a few of you do, we're all nerds, can actually read the reserve bits as they flow through and if the packet has been played with, either A, switch them back to zero, which would preserve your existing data stream and really annoy whoever's trying to do anything, or B, just drop the packets entirely, which is a slightly more aggressive solution, but I suppose if somebody's trying to hijack your traffic, you probably don't want that machine communicating with the internet no matter what, regardless of whether that current packet has been played around with, because they have something on their computer you don't want them to have. All right, so we do have a GitHub link. It's very simple. You can write it down. You can take a picture of it. We'll be dropping code up there as we get all the examples put up in there that we use today. The demo itself is fairly simple, not too complicated, because again, we don't trust the hotel Wi-Fi at a hacker convention. We've been to DEF CON. We don't trust you people. <laughs> Give you all a second to write down the link, which is actually, wow, that's a really simple link. I like that link. Didn't even have to use a URL shortener. All right, now you can take over the computer and sure. load up the demo. Yes, I'm positive this time. Clear out the screen so we can show the usage of the commands. This is my very Matrix-themed color scheme for Kali. I hope you all appreciate it. It's really fun when you sit somewhere and run some sort of exploitation tool and some random English major looks over your shoulder and wonders what the hell you're doing. <laughs> all right, so left-hand side will be the receiving, or actually, uh, first show them the actual original packet. So run that one with, nope, you want to run that with this. There you go. There are actually instructions attached to the program itself. If you run the program without any sort of flags, it will yell at you. It's very well built. I tried. Okay, so you ran that one. You went through, and okay, so the part we should be looking at is specifically the... Can you step off the... Okay, good. Couldn't quite reach the point. Okay, so this is a TCP packet going from loopback to loopback because, well, of course it is. Checksum is normal. And right up here, we have the not shown reserved bits, because of course we don't. Oh, there it is. 
So the reserve bits are currently set to zero L for some reason, Scabby decides to translate the binary for zero, zero, zero to just zero. When you see it changed later, it will be seven L because that's one, one, one. And you can see that the padding for the packet is all just zeros over and over and over again until it reaches the default length it should have. This is fairly long because there's no actual information carried in this packet. Normally it'd be much shorter. So now if we go over to the other side of the screen, we can actually start sending information. Yep. All right, so you can see it's just waiting for you to enter whatever data you want to send across. And on the other side of the screen, it doesn't actually have to be cleared. You can send whatever message you want. All right, somebody name a word. Anybody? Hello. hello. Sure, send hello. Oh, wow, hello world. Very, very cliched of you. Thank you. So now you can see that the Reserve bits have actually been flagged, so the program knows to look for it because there is actually other traffic being bounced around on this normally. We don't want to review all of it. We don't care what's in all of it. We only care about the parts we played with. So you can see that we changed around the reserve bits. So now it's 7L, which is just 111 binary 7, translates over. They did it for humans to read. Unfortunately, we're not humans. So now you can see that down in the padding, can you just hit enter a few times to scroll down? Uh, control C, exit out of the program, then hit enter a few times. And now you've cleared out the example. Send something again. Then hit enter a few times. So we can see. All right, there we go. So now you can see that it actually carries across the message inside of the padding. The rest of the padding is still filled in with zeros because if you don't fill in the padding, things get very, very confused. But now that you've actually carried the message across, you can see that it's there. The rest of the information is all still the same. It still uses all of the same ports, all of the same information. The checksum has been changed since it got filled in. So yeah, it's very nice. It's good for transmitting information over existing applications. Now, we don't have a incredible, I'd love to be able to show you the website, but we don't actually have Wi-Fi at the moment because the Wi-Fi is awful. So yes, is there any other comments you would like to add? It's not the most complicated talk on the planet. No. Very quick, actually. It was very quick, actually. So, yes. Do we have questions? You do have a question. Yes. Sure. Do you want to open up the actual code we're currently running instead of the old code we're not currently running? Yeah. All right. So, this is the most recent version of the coding. You can ignore that one import of threading, it does nothing. So yes, so what we have here is we have, eh, scroll down a bit so they can see the menu itself and we can work our way up. So right now we have just a menu being created and then it chooses whatever options you want. And then assuming you want to receive packets, which is in my opinion, the more interesting of the two options because changing things is very boring. You can actually go, we are using the sniff function of Scappy to grab all of the packets which are actually incoming or outgoing, but in most cases it really doesn't matter because you want to see both the incoming and outgoing traffic because you care what you're saying as well as what they're saying. So it sniffs all the traffic, hands it up to the declutter. Declutter just checks to see if the reserve bits have actually been changed to the 7L, which again translates to 111 in binary. And then if it does, it prints out the message. It also, for convenience for the demo's sake, removes all of the extra bytes that we don't care about, the random dash zero x sec or dash x zero zeros. That way we can read it more easily. Now if we scroll up a little bit further, oh, oh you're way down there. All right, we can see that we, uh, a little bit further, we want to show them the one that actually works. All right, so basically this is our little function to demonstrate sending information, modifying the packet with Scappy. This is not the exact one. This is to create a blank packet and send it. The one to modify them is slightly different, but this will do. So all it does is, is quite simple. It actually just grabs your message. It creates the packet with the reserved bits changed. It creates the pad padding. As, oh, it actually overwrites the padding twice. That's weird. OK, whatever. And then it just adds in your message. You can actually overload the padding of a TCP packet and send it over the network. We've had no issues doing so. I wouldn't personally recommend it because it could start to explode things, but it works. The actual library does check to make sure you're not doing that. And then it adds on the extra information to make sure that the padding is of the correct size. It's not too small because for some reason it cares a lot more if the packet is too small than it does if the packet is too large. 
I'm guessing that's because you can actually enable things such as jumbo packets. So networks have learned by now to not be too surprised when packets come across that are larger than they technically should be. So yeah, then it just fires it away over the network with no issues at all. Yeah, question. Yeah, it sends across as ASCII just fine. It is strange that you don't have to match the formatting. Not quite sure what's going on with that. Yeah. Yeah, Scappy does have a lot of the things in the background handled for us. That's part of the reason why we used it and didn't just write it, because you could recreate this entire concept using just a straight HTTP library, but that's a lot of extra work. Scappy does do a lot of it for us. So I would not be surprised if it does actually get transferred at some point. Any further questions? You mean the issue? Oh, you have a question behind you, though. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, if you had compromised the system in such a way that you could kind of accept each session again and then yeah. insert CMC in your regular browser, um, would you actually be successful with that? Or could you only. Um, so yeah, that actually segues well with his question. We were really successful in virtualized environments, we have full control. This is very easy. Actual environments, it gets a bit iffier depending on the exact implementation people use because there is actually a shockingly, well, okay, I can't say shockingly, we're nerds, a shockingly large amount of debate regarding the exact interpretation of the for future use of reserved bits. Some companies take that to mean let's reset them and delete them all. Others take that as we can do whatever. So the exact usage on hardware works in a virtualized environment or the one we have at our house or the computer science labs, but not over the greater campus networks, works sometimes over the internet. It's very odd as to whether or not it'll work in a larger scale. It's good as an extension of your existing library of tools. It's not really meant to be a standalone thing. So you can insert command and control into existing traffic. On an internal network, it's much easier to do. That's the very easy thing to do. We've had success with that. From an external network, Depends on the external network, really. Same goes for VPNs. Oh, yeah. VPNs are really weird because they reset your connections. Mm -hmm. They repackage everything, which makes sense. It's a VPN. You wouldn't want it leaking your information. Yeah. Any further questions? We did have a lot of fun experiences getting this to work on a college network that didn't really know what we were doing and sending information across that the firewalls did not particularly appreciate because it turns out college students like to torrent a lot of things so they're not big fans of having peer-to-peer -peer connections which have lots of weird traffic attached to them so when you start bouncing them across you start getting weird questions from the IT people asking what on earth are you doing why are you sending broken packets across the network we get emails stop it so that's when we went virtualized because we don't want that to happen anymore we don't want to anger them <laughs> so yeah oh another question uh, got it back, then I'll come back to you. Yep. So, um, based on IBS, what do you think is the difference between like consistent and non packets? Because you're not going to use most packets in your library, you can just say No, most wouldn't, but a lot of IDSs don't check. That's the thing. You can actually, you can look in Wireshark and actually see that these packets have been modified. But that's part of the debate with the whole whether or not the reserved bits are reserved and should be kept for future use. Because in theory, at some point, they'll change. A lot of companies don't check them. They figure that they could be changed in the future and they wouldn't want to just murder their product accidentally. So that's, yeah. Yep. It's very easy to catch. It's incredibly easy to catch. And that's part of the thing we were talking about with the PFSense firewalls. If those bits are changed, you know someone's doing something weird that they shouldn't be. But it's an incredibly obvious thing that you can use as a data channel that doesn't, no one really checks. Okay, we've sent over, uh, chat programs work really well over this. We've sent over some, we actually got a reverse shell working on another computer because we were able to send the information over an existing session. I believe that was actually a web server that we had. Yeah, that was one of the web servers. 
we opened up a website and as the website was loading, when you sent out the request asking, I want this page, it's like here, also run this command for me. And it could get the results back if you compromise the other computer, but you do not actually need to be able to see what the results are if you want to just rmrf slash a random web server without telling anyone. So yeah, we had a lot of fun and could do a lot more demos, but we don't actually have internet because we didn't expect internet, by the way. That was not an unplanned thing. We came into this planning to not have internet because it's a hacker convention. All right. Did you have another question? Oh, yeah. More covert. Well, if uh, one of the things we're actually looking at still is IPsec, which is encrypted IP traffic, could does have a few other fields that could be played around with, and those are encrypted. You can't just read those. That's a lot of fun. But there are entire other layers that you can exploit and add more information into. The big thing about it is most of the places that you can modify without anything freaking out are just one or two bits. So you can add, say, flags and options and carry things across like that, but you don't get a very large amount of bandwidth, unlike with the padding where you can actually get a few bytes, and if you grab a few extra packets, you can get a few more bytes, and once you start fragmenting things, you can get a lot larger amount of information across. Do you have another question? I haven't driven home that fact yet. Oh, okay. Apparently, I need to emphasize the fact that you can send across entire programs with this. You know, when we set up the reverse shell, you could actually send across an entire, say, bash script, although personally, I'd recommend just using wget and grabbing it from somewhere else, but anyways. So you can actually send across, what? It does include also the fact that, uh, if you also really wanted to, if you're deploying this out in a field and you decide you need an update, say you forgot an import or whatever, you could potentially send its own update through its own channels without anyone knowing again. Another fun method we've uh, tried with. That's right. uh, yes, that's right. When you do the code execution inside of Python, the Python script that's currently running can actually write its own Python script, then close itself, and then somehow also open itself back up again with the newly updated code. So you can send across, once you get the actual delivered payload from whatever you use to exploit the network, if you have a reverse shell put into it, you can send little bits of code over the channel and then update and add more imports. Say you wanted to import the, well, you'd have the subparts. Uh, let's see, what would you want to import? Say you wanted to import your custom library for Bitcoin mining on whatever machine you've just compromised. Now you have your botnet on there. You could import that later, run the commands to pip install it all in the background using the covert channel. And well, if they're paying attention to their machine, they'll notice you have no traffic. And then you can have your botnet start issuing commands. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope you have fun at your convention. <laughs> that was short.